Jeremy, you're the chief executive of Circle Internet Financial. Sometimes that's described as a, probably erroneously, as a Bitcoin company. Um, but I think that's because everyone sort of knows what Bitcoin is, and people are new to this idea of the blockchain. So tell us about how your business uses both of those things. Yeah, sure. So um, we describe Circle as a social payment app. Um, and I'll come back to that. But you know, basically, when we started the company, the idea was that we thought, for consumers at least, that money should work the way that the internet works. Uh, we can send and receive emails instantly, globally, anywhere in the world for free. We can have a video call with anyone on the planet for free instantly. You know, uh, we can share content or opinions. Uh, we can find and discover information. All these sort of uh, are, are kind of free utilities on the internet. And, we thought that a number of technologies were emerging that made it possible to do that with money and to make money instant, global, free to move around and store and, and also hopefully fun uh, in the same way that messaging has become a sort of core behavior. So um, when we started the company three years ago, one of the fundamental innovations that we were looking at was Bitcoin and the, and the Bitcoin blockchain in particular. But our idea wasn't that the world needs a new currency. Um, it was that uh, the Bitcoin blockchain in particular could be a kind of um, new protocol that is a protocol for moving value instead of a protocol for moving information and data and messages. So we have HTTP as an open way to move information and data around the world uh, globally for free. And we have SMTP and SMS and VOIP. And these are distributed decentralized protocols for communications. And so the Bitcoin blockchain is basically an open protocol for, for value transfer. So um, we built a model where that sort of sits behind the scenes. So you have dollars or euro or pound sterling or whatever currency, and you can essentially um, transmit it over the blockchain. So in other words, so you started with a concept. You said, we want money to be open in the same way that you can send an email to anybody, right? You don't have to think, oh, do I need to send this email internationally? Right. Uh, I have a Gmail address. They have a Yahoo address. Can I send them an email? Exactly. And so what the behind Bitcoin was that public ledger, right, where you could, anybody can post something. And so therefore, it became, it made money sort of like email in that sense, right? That's right. And I think, um, you know, we want a, an open model for value exchange, just like we have open models for communications and media and content sharing. And so um, exactly, the email analogy is a really good one. Um, you know, everyone doesn't have to all use the same email service. We can use lots of different email services or lots of different mobile carriers, and our messages can, can get to those. And so we want money to work the same way, and so we need an open way to do that. The history of, of payment networks is they're all closed, they're all walled gardens, and, uh, and they try and control both the consumer and the merchant in a, in a, in a kind of closed way. And I think we're now entering an era where, um, you know, value transfer is, is sort of works the same way that the rest of the internet works and, and that'll be great for consumers. But, but you're not you're not charging, right? And so That's I guess right. the question I had is sort of uh, not to be the closet moderator. Um, Join in. How do you how get do you, ganged how, up on <laughs> how do you make money? Yeah. Um, it, you know, that's what I keep thinking about. I was looking at PayPal, and they, you know, they're hemorrhaging from certain aspects of their business, Venmo. Um, and I'm, I think, to your model, I think it's a great idea. It's, it's really cool. It's neat. It's innovative, disruptive. But then how, what is, what, how do you see you guys making money? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at um, the consumer internet, um, almost all the things that consumers use are free. And you know, searching the world's information is free, and communicating is free, and sharing content is free, whatever form of content. And so we think that storing and sharing and using money should just be a free service for consumers on the internet. Um, so we're focused on just making that work, making that work globally, making that work across the major currencies of the world, and making that a great, delightful experience. And in the future, we'll introduce other products where we do generate revenue. Um, but that's just not the focus right now. The focus is how do we scale out a great global consumer experience for transmitting value the same way we transmit information. So you're saying that money might follow the same trajectory that, like we talked about, like email, like like online storage. You know, where where the 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 medium itself is a commodity, right? right? It doesn't cost you anything to do those things, and so people have to build interesting businesses on yeah. top of that, I right? Mean, and know. at Circle, you guys are doing that. You're starting with a social application, right? Like you can interact with people and chat with people, right? Yeah, and this, this, you know, I think there's a lot with all this that we can learn from, from 
existing consumer behaviors. So messaging as a model and user interface for how we interact with people and businesses and other things. Um, so the, the whole center of the, me of the model and UI is it's all message oriented and, um, and actually learning a lot from what's happened in China. I mean, social payment apps, if you're in China, you use them every day, all day. They're extremely common. Hundreds of millions of people use them, but they don't here. Um, there are some apps um, that have some adoption, but nothing in the tens of millions or hundreds of millions of views. Why, why, why is that? Why is that? I mean, I, th I think uh, China specifically uh, had a number of things happening. They leapfrogged from laptops to mobiles. They leapfrogged from traditional bank accounts to a kind of mobile first uh, experience. And then the, the, the fundamental consumer behavior that lit this up there was actually not you know, settling debt or IOUs, it was social gifting. Right. It was using money with creative expressions and gifting that actually turned on this behavior for, for Chinese consumers. And then it became embedded in everything. Um, and so I think there's a lot that we can learn from that. And I think those are behaviors that the West will ultimately adopt as well. So uh, now, you know, Victor, people talk about I mean, this, this, this model of taking something that was previously um, sort of controlled, it ran on certain rails, right, the way money does today. So if you want to use your credit card, it goes on Visa or MasterCard. If you want to transfer money from your checking account, it uses the ACH system. There are obviously many things that work like that. So people are, aren't just talking about applying this to money, as Jeremy is, but talking about applying it to a variety of different businesses. And, it's quite a powerful idea. So how, how are people approaching this, Victor? What are the conversations that are happening at big companies well, look, around that it, idea? It, it, it applies across a lot of areas. I mean, if you, you can look at power generation transmission. You could look at one of my companies in the Valley um, is a healthcare, inform healthcare information technology company looking at, again, leveraging the, the blockchain technology. And of course, to your point, that's what this is all about. It's less about having that in the forefront, but as, as opposed to having it behind the scenes and then putting your business model on top of that. So again, I, I see it as a really a, um, an innovative sort of approach to the marketplace where, again, you're getting the benefits of security, um, and w which, of course, as you're pointing out, the financial services sector is one sector that really likes this. I mean, financial services and healthcare, U.S., big. It's really big. Um, and so, and you raised an interesting example there with healthcare data, right? So in the same way that now certain people control your healthcare data, wouldn't it be better if you could travel that around with that data, if you change doctors, things like that? But one of the reasons that healthcare data is hard to port is because there's a lot of privacy, there's, it's very important that the information is accurate, things like that. So, so one of the reasons that money and other things run on these, these controlled rails is because there are certain policy or social reasons that people have developed to do that. So g given the openness of the architecture of public blockchains and the way that currencies like Bitcoin work, can we, do you think that we can realize that potential while still having those protections or are we going to have to make a trade-off somewhere along the line? I mean, the people who are close to this, I think, um, you, you, you look at the blockchain as sort of a global trust machine. That was a phrase the economists used a while ago. And I, I think it's a really powerful idea in that if, for example, you know, what you're replacing is social institutions that where humans that are, who are fallible and who can, are corruptible and who make political decisions can um, make decisions about trust and transactions, the integrity in, uh, of transactions. So for example, if I want to record a vote, and I want to know that the vote is, uh, is tamper-proof, it's irreversible, uh, and it's auditable, and it's on a secure uh, machine that no one in the world can crack. That sounds pretty good. I'd like to record my vote on that. Or I could have a consortia of local governments who are going to appoint people who are going to over, you know, oversee some paperwork and some manual systems, and that's how we're going to re record the vote. I think the global trust machine is a better way to record the vote. And so these public blockchains have a lot of power because they're irreversible, immutable, they're private, they're secure, they're auditable in, in ways that past systems, it was never possible to do that. And so I think those are, those are attributes that when there's any um, fiduciary or any counterparty that you have to deal with, if you have that capability between you and the counterparty, that's that's better than another intermediary who actually can be corrupted. Right, so medium long term, this is a winner. 
it's short term where you're going to have sort of the, the lag effect, right? And every jurisdiction, as we were talking about, uh, has uh, different approaches to this. So you might be, for example, um, here in the States, for example, we were talking about this earlier, you have 50 states. That are, they're, they're in the middle of all this. And, and then, each one of those wants to control its election. They might want to do it a little differently than another state, right, as we've been learning here, you know, week after week in the U.S. But they're also comfortable, by the way, having local control. So how do you cede local control to the feds, right? That's a big thing here in the States. Fast forward to a unitary government like the U.K., um, especially in the, in the financial services sector, there's actually a policy out there that's saying, we want you guys to figure out how to disrupt in the financial services sector. So they're willing to take a little more risk from the financial services sector side as compared to the states, which are actually, you know, you're always thinking of Silicon Valley, we're at the, the cutting edge of everything, except in the context of policy right now. So I think we're gonna have a little lag stateside till we catch up and regain the lead on this. So how, how will these things happen in a country like the U.S. where not only do you have uh, jurisdictional, you know, you have 50 states, but even unlike the U.K., which has like one kind of financial regulator, the U.S. has a number of different financial regulators and quasi sort of financial, quasi governmental financial regulators. How, how does blockchain and the openness of that, how, how does that happen in a world where you have all of those fiefdoms that might, you know, want to protect their turf. How, how, how will we, do we need an act of Congress to do something? It, how will it, may, it, work? it may need an act of Congress. And the thing to remember about things like the Bitcoin blockchain, which is the, sort of the only functioning public blockchain that you can use today, um, you know, it, it's not just going to be used for, you know, transmitting currency value. It's going to be used for storing the title to your house. It's going to be used for voting. It's going to be used for any, any kind of intermediary trust-based transaction. Um, it'll be used for that. And so the jurisdictional issues are really complicated, right? It's sort of like when the web came out, you know, should the FCC oversee the web or should, you know, the, you know, the Department of Commerce oversee the web? No one actually oversees the web. It's just a technology. It is. It, what needs to be evaluated is how do, what are the business activities in interacting with that underlying technology and, and what rules are necessary. And in the U.S., in the financial world, uh, fintech is constrained because the 50-state issue. We, gotta, we, we had to go get licenses from every state that required one, which is 46 states. Very expensive, very time-consuming, et cetera. As that rolls its way into governance, into securities, into bonds, into voting, into insurance, into all of the fiduciary trust industries, it's going to get complicated and I think it will require uh, something like the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which, which by the way, set that a point. foundation for an open internet. Exactly. And, and what you started to see back then is, you know, states taking inconsistent approaches. And then that really drives on the point that you really need to have a unifying body, whether regulatory or through uh, legislative uh, here in the States, which just takes time. I would submit to you that probably you'll see New York, California sort of taking the lead, other states trying to take the lead, but then it'll sort of get messy, and then again you'll have a, a federal overlay of one level or another. But it's also just relevant to note that like, these, are, these are global policy issues. They're, it's not straightforward to say, oh, the U.S. will regulate it this way, and China will regulate it this way, and you know, Chile will regulate it this way. It's, it, it's sort of, it's a technology that exists on the internet and the interaction with it is as open as the interaction that we have with internet protocol. And, uh, and so the jurisdictional issues and the, and the nation state boundaries that historically built kind of constraints around money, I think some of that's going to get blown open and that's going to create the need for greater global policy coordination on financial systems, monetary policy and the like. And, and so, Victor, how, so let's, let's take it back. Okay, at the macro level, we can imagine a lot of challenges, whether those are technical, political, institutional. What about at the micro level? How close are we to having products that, like, a company could take off the shelf and say, okay, and, and you, you hear about applications like this. Um, you're producing a very limited edition of a certain sneaker. You might produce a hundred of them. People who own them want to have some sort of certificate that says, I am the owner of one of these unique items. 
rather than having you know a paper certificate or or or, or, or then a, even a digital system where you both have a record of it, right? What blockchain allows is for there to be one record that everyone can access and see who owns those things. How close are we to having a product like that that can roll off the shelf and sort of be applied in you know anyone's business uh, to do those things? Well, I'll, I'll I'll punt it over to Jeremy, but I'll say this: we're starting to see it in a lot of different sectors. You mentioned healthcare. You're starting to see it there. Um, again, I think other sectors are going to start picking up from progress made in other sectors. And I think this will balloon, if you will. And then you, not all sectors are over-regulated. Those that are over-regulated are going to be behind. Those that are less regulated, I'll say. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. I met with a company earlier today at Consensus, which is at a sort of blockchain-focused event across town. Um, and they're a digital notary. And, uh, and they, they work with, they, they're trying to sell their service to people who issue certificates. So if I'm a university and I issue a diploma and I want to make sure that people don't fake diplomas, which is a pretty big issue, um, they want those to basically issue the, the diploma on the blockchain. And so I, as the recipient, receive it at, a, you know, at an address and it's verifiable that I have that and control it. Um, and so it's, it's essentially a digital certificate that's incorruptible, immutable, and it's not stored with anyone. It's just stored on the global ledger. And so it allows for you to apply that. So that's, that's today. It's a company that exists yeah. that's doing these things. That's not common. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to require court cases and things like that to establish the provenance of some of this stuff. Right? It's, it's, until it's challenged in court, it's not really legal <laughs> in some ways. So, so, you know, we were talking about other sectors, taking cues from other sectors and some being behind others. The question I always have is sort of what, sort of what, what are you, do you, who are you worrying about? Like, do you worry about, like, the Facebooks and the Twitters um, who have obviously substan substantial resources behind them or no, no, they're doing their thing, I'm doing my thing? I and mean, we're, just, we're, we're just focused on building a, you know, an open global model for how value exchange can happen for consumers. And we want it to be open across any currency. We want it to be open and not just work in circle, but work across a protocol that can interoperate with other things. We want it to work on any operating system, any device. We want it to work in any messaging platform. So we don't have the strategy tax of we have to make Facebook successful or we have to make Twitter successful. We have to make Circle successful. And, and the nice thing about the internet is all these are open platforms, right? So I can plug Circle into Twitter or I can plug it in as a bot in Messenger or I can make it an app on iOS. Uh, and so I can make it an app in WeChat chat in China and, and so on. And so um, we don't have to live in one place. And that allows us to be ruthlessly or relentlessly focused on solving the consumer problem of how do I store and share value. Um, and I think that there is, gonna, there is an opportunity for you know, a few big global companies to emerge that are sort of focused on that kind of new global consumer banking experience that aren't a social network, that aren't a search engine, that aren't a video sharing site, et cetera. And so just, just as, a, as, a, as a final thought, um, as you're talking, it sounds like you know, these are all things that, that we can do on the internet today, in a sense, right? Like you can have, we talk about the cloud all the time, where data lives. What, what, just to wrap up, what ultimately is the advantage of a blockchain world versus just a place where data lives in a cloud or somewhere on a remote server where you can both access it? What is that, what is that fundamental thing that's, that, that differentiates it? Yeah, I mean, um, Right now, if you want to move value around, it, there's gatekeepers and there's tolls, and it's insecure, and there's a lot of identity theft and fraud. Uh, and we're trying to operate in a more globalized, integrated world. And I think the big difference is you know, value, if it moved much more easily and freely, um, and in a way which was protected people's privacy and was highly secure and uh, didn't have the kind of exposures and it wasn't just stovepipes that were, you know, sort of siloed, but it was sort of, again, more like the web would work. I think the kind of global network effects that you got from the web itself, you would start to see in the economic sphere. Um, and I think that's pretty exciting. Cool. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Jeremy and Victor. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody.